Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I had a pretty good day yesterday. Uh, I was just uh, at a fountain making some wishes and... Uh, uh, oh, uh, hold on a second. Oh, gosh. Uh, I just want to tell you guys what I can wish for. Uh, maybe you can guess. Uh. Some of what I'm going to go over today is going to be a rehash of things uh, many of you may already know, but I think it's really important to review and just understand um, our audiences a little bit more and the values that we can rely on when we're designing transmedia franchises and uh, creating transmedia brands. So bear with me, and I know this is a longish video, so if you understand the concepts, you can certainly uh, fast forward through it, uh, and then you can take a look at what I uh, say in the wrap up. But again, I would just definitely pay attention uh, just to these concepts and you know apply them uh, in your smartings and your learning journals uh, in our readings uh, and our uh, posts this week. The cognitive surplus is foundational uh, for what we're doing in this class um, with regards to transmedia storytelling, assumptions about audiences, and now publics, which you're going to learn about, or fans and fandoms. So cognitive surplus represents the ability of the world's population to volunteer and contribute and collaborate on large, sometimes global projects. It's the world's free time and talents, and it's the media tools that we are prosumers, which means we're producers and consumers at the same time. Cognitive surplus uh, is part of the attention economy, and uh, the idea that you know what we're competing for with all these media franchises and things are people's attention. Now, the value system from the past in the 20th century was that we are rational, self-maximizing actors. We don't necessarily want to share or create. We're passive couch potatoes. And you're going to learn more about what that means in the video that follows. The value system today has shifted. So it's designed things for the assumption that people want to, that people want to create and share. Designed for that assumption that they want to get involved uh, with franchises. Uh, the value system today also is connected to communal value. So we create um, things by participants for each other. So that's sort of that prosumer idea. And there's also the civic value, which is value created by participants, but shared by society as a whole, not just for participants. And uh, in the video, you're going to learn a little bit about more about what that means. Now, I want you to really pick up on these things and think about how it connected to last week's reading uh, about publics and audiences and about participation versus collaboration. Uh, so these are key concepts to understand. And again, I hope this uh, helps illustrate them a little more. The story starts in Kenya. Uh, in December of 2007, when there was a disputed presidential election. And in the immediate aftermath of that election, and there was an outbreak of ethnic violence. And there was a lawyer in Nairobi, Oria Kola, who some of you may know from her TED Talk, who began blogging about it on her site, Kenyan Pundit. And shortly after the election and the outbreak of violence, the government suddenly imposed a significant media blackout. And so weblogs went from being commentary as part of the media landscape to being a critical part of the media landscape in trying to understand where the violence was. And Akola solicited from her commenters more information about what was going on, and the comments began pouring in, and Akola would collate them, she would post them, and she quickly said, it's too much. I, can, I could do this all day, every day, and I can't keep up. There is more information about what's going on in Kenya right now than any one person can manage. If only there was a way to automate this. And two programmers who read her blog held their hands up and said, we could do that. And in 72 hours, they launched You Shahidi. You Shahidi, the name means witness or testimony in Swahili, is a very simple way of taking reports from the field, whether it's from the web or, or critically via mobile phones and SMS, aggregating it and putting it on a map. That's all it is, but that's all that's needed because what it does is it takes the tacit information available to the whole population. Everybody knows where the violence is, but no one person knows what everyone knows. And it takes that tacit information and it aggregates it and it maps it and it makes it public. And that that maneuver called crisis mapping was kicked off 
uh, in Kenya in January of 2008. And enough people looked at it and found it valuable enough that the programmers who created Yushahidi decided they were going to make it open source and turn it into a platform. It's since been deployed in Mexico to track electoral fraud. It's been deployed in Washington, D.C. to track snow cleanup. And it's been used most famously in Haiti in the aftermath of the earthquake. And when you look at the map, now posted on the Yushahidi front page, you can see that the number of deployments in Yushahidi has gone worldwide. Right. This went from an, a single idea and a single implementation in East Africa in the beginning of 2008 to a global deployment in less than three years. Now, what Ecola did would not have been possible without digital technology. What Ecola did would not have been possible without human generosity. And the interesting moment now, the number of environments where the social design challenge relies on both of those things being true. That is the resource that I'm talking about. I call it cognitive surplus, and it represents the ability of the world's population to volunteer and to contribute and collaborate on large, sometimes global projects. Cognitive surplus is made up of two things. The first, obviously, is the world's free time and talents. The world has over a trillion hours a year of free time to commit to shared projects. Now, that free time existed in the 20th century, but we didn't get Yushahidi in the 20th century. That's the second half of cognitive surplus. The media landscape in the 20th century was very good at helping people consume, and we got, as a result, very good at consuming. But now that we've been given media tools, the internet, mobile phones, that let us do more than consume, what we're seeing is that people weren't couch potatoes because we liked to be. We were couch potatoes because that was the only opportunity given to us. We still like to consume, of course, but it turns out we also like to create and we like to share. And it's those two things together, right? Ancient human motivation and the modern tools to allow that motivation to be joined up in large-scale efforts that are the new, the new design resource. And using cognitive surplus, we're starting to see truly incredible experiments in scientific, literary, artistic, political efforts, designing. We're also getting, of course, a lot of lolcats. Right? Lolcats are cute pictures of cats made cuter with the addition of cute captions. And they are also part of the abundant media landscape we're getting now. This is, this is one of the participatory uh, one of the participatory models we see coming out along with you, Shahid. Right. Now, let us stipulate, as the lawyers say, that lolcats are the stupidest possible creative act. Right. There's others that are, there are other candidates, of course, but lolcats will do as a general case. Right. But here's the thing. The stupidest possible creative act is still a creative act. Right. Someone who has done something like this, however mediocre and throwaway, right, has, has tried something, has put something forward in public. And once they've done it, they can do it again, and they can work on getting it better. Right? There is a spectrum between mediocre work and good work, and as anybody who's worked as an artist or a creator knows, it's a spectrum you're constantly struggling to get on top of. The gap is between doing anything and doing nothing. Right? And someone who makes a lolcat has already crossed over that gap. Now, it's tempting to want to get the Yushahidis without the lolcats, right? To get the serious stuff without the throwaway stuff. But media abundance never works that way. Freedom to experiment means freedom to experiment with anything. Even with the sacred printing press, we got erotic novels 150 years before we got scientific journals, right? So rather than focus right now, so before I talk about what is, I think, the critical difference between lolcats and Yushahidi, I want to talk about their shared source. And that source is designed for generosity. Right? It is one of the curiosities of our historical era that even as cognitive surplus is becoming a resource we can design around, social sciences are also starting to explain how important our intrinsic motivations are to us, how much we do things because we like to do them rather than because our boss told them to do them or because we're being paid to do them. This is a graph from a paper by Yuri Nisi and Alfredo Rusticini, who set out to test at the beginning of this decade what they call deterrence theory. And deterrence theory is a very simple theory of human behavior. 
If you want someone to do less of something, add a punishment and they'll do less of it. Simple, straightforward, commonsensical, also largely untested. And so they went and studied 10 daycare centers in Haifa, Israel. And they studied those daycare centers at the time of highest tension, which is pickup time. At pickup time, the teachers who have been with your children all day would like you to be there at the appointed hour to take your children back. Meanwhile, the parents, perhaps a little busy at work, running late, running errands, want a little slack to pick the kids up late. So Nisi and Rustachini said, how many instances of late pickups are there at these 10 daycare centers? And they saw, and this is what the graph is, these are, these are the number of weeks and these are the number of late arrivals, that there were between six and 10 instances of late pickups on average in these 10 daycare centers. So they divided the daycare centers into two groups. And they, the white group there is the, the control group. They changed nothing. But the group of daycare centers rep, represented by the black line, they said, we are changing this bargain as of right now. Right? If you pick your kid up more than 10 minutes late, we're going to add a 10 shekel fine to your bill. Boom. No ifs, ands, or buts. And the minute they did that, the behavior in those daycare centers changed. Late pickups went up every week for the next four weeks until they topped out at triple the pre-fine average, and then they fluctuated at between double and triple the pre-fine average for the life of the fine. And you can see immediately what happened, right? The fine broke the culture of the daycare center. By adding a fine, what they did was communicate to the parents that their entire debt to the teachers had been discharged with the payment of 10 shekels, and that there was no residue of guilt or social concern that the parents owed the teachers. And so the parents quite sensibly said, 10 shekels to pick my kid up late. What could be bad? <laughs> the, the, the explanation of human behavior that we inherited in the 20th century was that we are all rational, self-maximizing actors. And in that explanation, Right. The daycare center that had no contract should have been operating without any constraints. But that's not right. They were operating with social constraints rather than contractual ones. And critically, the social constraints created a culture that was more generous than the contractual constraints did. So Nisi and Rustichini run this experiment for a dozen weeks, run, run the fine for a dozen weeks. And then they say, OK, that's it, all done fine. And then a really interesting thing happens. Nothing changes, right? The culture that got broken by the fine stayed broken when the fine was removed. Not only are economic motivations and intrinsic motivations uh, so incompatible, that incompatibility can persist over long periods. So the trick, right, in designing these kinds of situations is to understand where you're relying on the economic part of the bargain, as with the, the parents paying the teachers, and when you're relying on the social part of the bargain, when you're really designing for generosity. And this brings me back to the Lalkats and to you, Shahidi. This is, I think, the range that matters. Both of these rely on cognitive surplus. Both of these design for the assumption that people like to create and we want to share. Here is the critical difference between these, right? Lolcats is communal value. It's value created by the participants for each other. Communal value on the networks we have right, is, is everywhere. Every time you see a large aggregate of shared publicly available data, whether it's photos on Flickr or videos on YouTube or whatever. This is good. I like Lolcats as much as the next guy, maybe a little more even. But this is also a largely solved problem. I have a hard time envisioning a future in which someone is saying, where, oh, where can I find a picture of a cute cat? Right. Yushihidi, by contrast, is civic value. It's value created by the participants but enjoyed by society as a whole. The goals set out by Yushihidi are not just to make life better for the participants, but to make life better for everyone in the society in which Yushihidi is operating. And that kind of civic value is not just a side effect of opening up to human motivation. It really is going to be a side effect of what we collectively make of these kinds of efforts. There are a trillion hours a year of participatory value up for grabs. 
that will be true year in and year out. The number of people who are going to be able to participate in these kinds of projects is going to grow. Right? And we can see that organizations designed around a culture of generosity can achieve incredible effects without an enormous amount of contractual overhead, a very different model than our default model for large-scale group action in the 20th century. What's going to make the difference here right, is what Dean Kamen said, the inventor and entrepreneur. Kamen said, free cultures get what they celebrate. Right? We've got a choice before us. Right? We've got this trillion hours a year. We can use it to crack each other up, and we're going to do that. That we get for free. But we can also celebrate and support and reward the people trying to use cognitive surplus to create civic value. And to the degree we're going to do that, to the degree that we're able to do that, we'll be able to change society. Thank you very much. I hope you understand how viewing uh, the audience or the public, your fans and fandoms, as having this cognitive surplus is really important uh, in designing your franchises and thinking about how you can do some transmedia branding with them. Now, I want to rehash a little bit on the importance of spreadability. So spreadability, uh, that's the potential, both technical and cultural, for audience to share and circulate content. So again, this is that idea that we've got this cognitive surplus that they're participating, and they're, uh, if you create media that is spreadable, you're going to have audiences, fans, that are going to want to uh, do work for you. Uh, sharing and circulating the content. And again, it's for their own purposes, sometimes with the permissions of right, rights holders, sometimes against their wishes. And that's up to you to negotiate. Negotiating this is uh, part of the thing that authors uh, are dealing with. Um, spreadable. Uh, why do metaphors matter? And I think this is really important because there have been a lot of metaphors with regards to media and considering how audiences operate. Uh, so metaphors matter because they help us visualize something that's unfamiliar and they help us contrast and compare concepts for imagining how the world works and how to be successful uh, in the world. Uh, metaphor, it's a technology for approaching problems and solving problems. It's a lens for analyzing things. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about why spreadable is such an important metaphor and how it connects uh, to cognitive surplus. So spreadophores or spreadable metaphors, uh, there's the idea that one that media is being designed to be spreadable with these assumptions, these value systems about uh, sharing and circulation, cognitive surplus. Uh, sticky is also another metaphor for understanding media today and also virus. Uh, so spreadable, we can think in terms of like peanut butter on bread, sticky, glue, and viruses like a sneeze. Um, so you can see some of the differences here. So when you consider uh, spreadable media, it explores how ideas circulate and where they travel. It disperses, right? So it goes out from the center and uh, kind of centrifugal, uh, spreads that way. Uh, when you think in terms of spreadable media, it values the way audiences themselves attract and hold attention. So you've got this active audience. With sticky and that glue idea, it explores counting an isolated audience. And you will have read this uh, in that most recent reading about what constitutes constituting meaningful participation. I think I got that right. Um, and there's a center, so it's all trying to bring everything to a center. It values the ways audiences are attracted and attention is held. So you've got this passive audience where people are going to one place instead of going to a variety of places. Uh, the virus, uh, also I'm sure you've heard of viral media, that sneeze, you're infecting an audience somehow. Kind of similar to that sticky idea, it's contagious, right? It's sort of, this is kind of an unrealistic metaphor. Uh, it's very difficult to design viral media or just... Uh, you know, the idea that you can just do this one thing and it's going to just uh, blow up. Uh, things don't really happen like that very often. Uh, media happens to you. Again, it's that passive audience idea. So again, I want you to think about that cognitive surplus uh, notion and understand how it connects uh, to that spreadable metaphor idea. Finally, let's just review how to design for spreadability. And this is going to come in handy when you're designing uh, your transmedia a media campaign. Okay, so it's available when and where audiences want it. It's portable, easily reusable, relevant to many audiences. It's a stream of material and understanding a people's or community's motivation. So it's uh, you understanding your audience a little bit more. Okay, so available when and where audiences want it. Right. Um, so if you've got it uh, on Instagram, if you got it on Facebook, if it's on Netflix. 
Those would be examples of available when and where audiences want it, right? These different platforms. It's portable, okay? You can watch it on your phone. You can watch it on your desktop. Easily reusable, okay? Watch it again and again. Uh, you can, like a meme, right? You can reuse that meme. It's relevant to many audiences. Uh, so again, uh, that would be designing something where you have aspects of it, drillable aspects that uh, a lot of people are going to want to uh, participate in. It's a stream of material, so it's just not uh, one thing and that's it. Uh, just like with bloggers, right? You can't just post one blog. You've got to keep posting blogs so that uh, you know people come back to you and they rely on you. And then understanding a people's or community's motivation, that's you understanding your audience and you looking a little bit more uh, about how they're participating and what they're talking about with regards to your, your franchise. Whew. I feel better. And I hope you guys do too. So listen, just keep up with the smartings. Remember, there's two per week. There's also uh, learning journals that you need to pay attention to. And those are usually weekly, but check the schedule because some weeks you won't be doing one. Check out the videos that are posted like this one uh, each week as well. And you're going to succeed uh, in the class. Uh, that's it. Uh, I'll see you guys during the video chats, which are optional.